prayers. I want you to bring your hurts to me. For I am the God that healeth thee.
carry us through these each and every day, moment by moment and day by day. I just ask that you bless the message and uh, all those that couldn't be here or away. Father, we just thank you that you're with them and with us in our week and our days. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Abundant Life, and we're so glad you could join us here this morning. If you are here for the very first time, we would like to give you a warm welcome. Please go to the back at our welcome table, and there's a QR code for you to scan, and we would love to have your information so we could contact you and see if we can help you on your journey to faith. Or if you're looking for a home church, we would like to get to know you. We love to celebrate at Abundant Life. And this week we have some birthdays and it's Lindsay's birthday this week. And Lindsay, we know how much you love your birthday and how you wish you could celebrate it all year round. So we just wanna say a happy birthday to you. And we just pray that this would be such a significant year for you as you take time this summer to just uh, have time for yourself and to read and pray and, and build those wonderful relationships in your life. We just pray that God would bless you. And it's Gladys's birthday this week too and Gladys, you've had a busy couple of weeks and so we're just so glad that um we could just say happy birthday to you uh we love you and we pray for you and we know that as you're in this next part of your journey that god is going to bless you and it's also pastor bill's birthday this week so happy birthday what can i say i think he's mr wonderful so we just pray that you have a great summer and that god would just fill you with his love and with his acceptance so this week we have our ladies coffee hour, our coffee break at Jean's house. She's gonna put her address on our women at home so you know how to go there. So just show up at 6.30 and bring your, your own coffee or tea. And you know what I know about Jean is last time she made us pie. I'm not saying you have to make us another pie, but that would be great, Jean. <laughs> so ladies, uh, just jump on in with that. And so again, if you're visiting, please go to the back and fill out our QR card and Abundant Life. We just pray that you have a great week, that God will be with you, that you would have time for him and that you would just let him speak to you in a significant way. See you soon. But thank you, Kathy, wherever you are. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, they say AI is going to take over in the future. And I, some, some, sometimes with the... Uh, you know, video announcement seems a little bit AI, but uh, she is alive and well somewhere, and uh, she has not missed bringing you an album for the week. And happy birthday to all of you who had July birthdays. Uh, that goes for all of you that were mentioned here, as well as any of you who might be perhaps visiting here, and it just so happens your birthday is in July. Uh, we do welcome you here this morning. If you're here, for your first time and you're visiting and maybe you're in the area on vacation and you just happen to drop in, uh, we're glad that you're here to worship with us. And uh, and I hope that you can plug into this mini-series that we began about oh, four or five weeks ago now, I suppose. And uh, I have a couple more messages to share with you and bring with you this morning. But, uh, but let me just mention briefly uh, there will be someone else ministering in my absence next Sunday. We will not be here. My wife and I will be at our uh, week, uh, our summer vacation week with our Lang family. All 16 of us with our, uh, all the Langs and spouses and so on. All of our grandkids. We have been blessed with eight grandkids. And uh, we are looking forward to enjoying them and uh, spending the week together with them at our cottage. So I won't be here next week. Someone will be here in my place. Um, and so, um, trust it uh, to do a great service next week as well. Well, last week, last week we talked about uh, how sometimes God's watch over our life sometimes includes correction. Sometimes God does correct us. He disciplines us because he loves us. But today is about judgment. And I, I want to say from the get-go, uh, that when we talk this morning in Revelation about the coming time of judgment, I am really not your normal um, uh, hell, fire, and brimstone kind of preacher. I just, that's not who I am. But you know what? Uh, there are things in the Word of God you can't ignore, and the wrath and the judgment of God is one of them. Um, one of the things that I observe my first time through Revelation, at least my first time taking a church that I was pastoring at the time through Revelation, was that in the midst of judgment, there was mercy in God's law. 
and uh, I hope that some of that will come through in the message today. Uh, but trust me, all through Revelation you see God giving more and more chances and opportunities and, and open doors to be able to, to get one's heart right with God and, and to be able to avoid the impending judgment. But there is a time of judgment coming on this world. Um, and I don't know, uh, you don't have to be a doomsday preacher to recognize that I think that anyone who has a, a, a sense of what God is doing in our world today and what God is, is about recognizes that there is a coming time of judgment that God is going to pronounce upon our world. Things are not like they used to be either. I mean, I know, I know life changes. I know there have been terrible dark times in the history in, in, in the past. I know, I am fully aware, I, I've, uh, uh, you've probably heard as well, there were many in the uh, dark days of the Third Reich under Adolf Hitler that were convinced he was the Antichrist and he has come and gone and he was not, in fact, the Antichrist. Uh, however, uh, that, that, uh, that character is about to appear at some time, at some point in the future, and you know what? It could be sooner rather than later. When I was uh, when I was a Christian, when I first became a Christian in the seventies, I heard so much about end time events. It seemed like uh, almost every uh, second Sunday there was a message somewhere anchored in Revelation and about uh, coming days of judgment and and uh, the rapture and the great tribulation and the millennial reign of Christ and so on. And and I, I'm trying to recall the last time I heard a message like that, or anything near like that. Um, I am in part uh, on this series because someone requested it, but more than that I think Jesus requested it. And so I hope that this is a help to you. So today I want to talk to you about judgment. Do not ever confuse our Father's loving correction with the wrathful judgment of a holy God against sin and evil. They are not one and the same. God will never treat you like those who reject his son. Never. He will treat you as a loving father if you know Jesus as your Savior. And so today, I, I confess I'm probably going to attempt the impossible. Uh, remember I said at the beginning of this series, I'm going to give you just the highlights of Revelation only in this mini-series. Well, guess what? Uh, I think I may have had, have to had I may, I may be required to add one more message this uh, to this series just to be able to do it justice um, and so uh, two weeks from now when I'm here will be the second last message then I'll cap off with with uh, on a very strong positive note about heaven that we pick up in Revelation 21 22 you know what Revelation is packed with meaning and far-reaching significance it's an incredible uh, seals Trumpets and bowls and antichrist, the false prophet, the great tribulation, horses and dragons and angels and demons. Small wonder that many Christians don't even read the book. Uh, 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 not to mention you quite understand what it says. Not the normal choice for morning devotions, is it? But uh, but we can't avoid revelation. And so, uh, although this is an overview, I'm going to try to get into a bit of detail. And so, try and hang with me, folks. I know that uh, the sun will be a little bit heavy. There's a lot of imagery, a lot of sim uh, symbolism, and a lot of uh, icons that are mentioned here. But, but try to follow with me, and I'll try to bring you along as best I possibly can. I've noticed this, partly through social media, um, just kind of online and even on our Abundant Life uh, uh, Facebook page that uh, that that and in part that some have just simply told me that some of you are reading Revelation and and some of you uh, Daniel and other prophetic books as well. Find it interesting. Um, in fact, I mentioned to someone recently that study of Revelation in parts at least requires a, an understanding of the book of Daniel as well because the two of those books are very clearly connected. One connects the Old Covenant with the New Covenant beautifully, and it helps us to understand what God is trying to tell us in Revelation. And so at times I may refer to Daniel as well in the future. 
There are sources that can help you to better understand the characters and the images and the symbols of this book. But, but never forget this. The Bible is and always will be the best interpreter of itself. So fit Revelation into the full context of Scripture and you will discover it will open wide to you in your understanding. Um, Sunday is supposed to be the last message. I'm aware of that. Uh, but I, I just, I just uh, can't do a fair overview in a few weeks, so I'm extending it by one or two more messages that I mentioned. Well, I want to talk to you this morning about the woes and the wood whoops. And we're a little ways from the whoop whoop. Uh, the celebration, the joy, the incredible things that await you and I as children of God. Uh, but before we get there, we have to we have to focus for a bit on the woes. Consider today's message the woes of Revelation. Uh, then in the final message, I'll talk to you about the woo woo to Revelation, so to speak, and the full completed plan of God. The final doom and defeat of Satan, the millennium, and heaven. And finally, the New Jerusalem. So, let's get started. And there's no better place to start than by not only reading this passage, but by, but by recognizing his vocation as well. In, when you read through Revelation, you always need to identify the characters and the location. Sometimes it's on earth, sometimes it's in heaven, sometimes it's in, in, in the mid part between those two. And so it's very important to identify the location. This next scripture comes from the throne room. Somehow John was lifted into the throne room of God. And we pick it up in Revelation chapter 4. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice that I had first heard speaking to me, like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. Once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald and circled the throne. Incredible passage. I was struck uh, in reading this passage by, by several things that just kind of jumped out at me. Number one is the throne. Let's remember that we, we speak in terms of the kingdom of God because it is that. It is the coming kingdom. In fact, it is a current kingdom. Jesus consistently, over and over again, in his ministry on earth, talked about the kingdom. Uh, and so, in the throne room, we have the king himself, a kingdom, and, and the throne, the ultimate seat of supreme authority and power. Years ago, Bev and I, for the first time in visiting the UK, we, we circled by the, uh, the palace, Buckingham Palace. It has an incredible presence of pomp and splendor and royalty to it. And uh, I'd like to say I was invited in to have tea with the Queen, but I did not. <laughs> but we're talking about a kingdom and a royalty that is like unlike anything we've ever known. Uh, it strikes me the people of privilege that are mentioned here. That John was invited into this scene. And, and there was an open door to the throne room, now and to come. The place of exquisite beauty. You know, beauty is a wonderful thing. Um, beauty is something that we can um, replicate or create to some degree as human beings, either in art or in design or in some other uh, creative work. But it is God who is able to, to create beauty. And so, uh, God alone is the master designer of beauty, and we see in Him incredible beauty. And then there's what struck me was the overall just feast for our senses. I didn't get the scripture on the, on the uh, video this morning, but I'd like to read it. Uh, for you. Flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder came from the throne. Seven fiery torches were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Something like a sea of glass, clear as crystal, was also before the throne. Four living creatures covered with eyes in front and in back were around the throne on each side. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, 
holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, who is he, and who is to come. I'm struck by the, by the sights and the sounds, the sights, the precious stones that we treasure and value, the crystal sea, our abundant water, the sound, rumbling, thunder, trumpet blast, the presence, the presence of God. Do you know something? That you and I are capable of experiencing the presence of God and you and I alone as, as Christian believers are only able to experience the presence of God. It could be called the Christian sixth sense that we are able to sense God's presence. When we worship Him and God draws near and we lift our hands and worship as an expression of response to the presence of God, that is, a, that is a palpable thing that you and I can experience. And the presence of God struck me for sure. And the sense of His holiness, probably one of the greatest of all of our senses, made possible only to the blood-washed child of God. I'm going to talk more of this uh, in a couple of weeks as I talk to you about heaven. But first, the woes. Here's the bad news. Bad news includes things like seals and trumpets and bowls of wrath. But it raises this question. Why does God need to judge the world? We read in Scripture that God is love, that His compassion is unequal, but you know something? His justice is equally paired with his love. We're going to let it all go. We're going to just say, that's all right. Let it slide. Not important. Evil, violence, crime, genocide. Worst of all, the rejection of Christ, God's Son, at the incredible cost. All of it with impunity, that would be most unjust. You know, when it comes to justice in the world, things are changing, aren't they? Convicted murderers serve shorter and shorter sentences. Grievous, heinous crimes against humanity go unpunished. Uh, in certain civilized places in our world, full term abortions occur. But, by the way, wait now. Don't dare request prayer and return to our schools or you're in hot water. Quite a day, isn't it? Judge of all the earth is soon to pass judgment on it all. And he and he alone is that one who is worthy to open the seals. I'm talking about antiquity here. In the days in which John was writing, um, there weren't modern pencils or stylus or ink. There was there was uh, there were scrolls, and they were they were made of papyrus, and on that papyrus there would be some way of etching words on that papyrus. And so we're talking about a very different day indeed. And so the only one able to uh, to open the seal and reveal what was on the scrolls. Christ himself. This is a single scroll with seven seals. The four living creatures are symbolic of the evangelists, the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Seal one shows us four horse and riders. Some believe this to be Christ because uh, he's riding on a white horse, but it's very different. So it's not likely that this is Christ. Um, the rider on the white horse here is defined by the by the term Stephanus, which is very different again. And the rider of the white horse that we that appears elsewhere in Scripture is, is defined by the Greek word uh, diadematta, which simply means uh, crown. And then we see then we see John being told to come. I was taught as a noted Christian in the 70s that this is, uh, this is proof, this is, this is indicative of the coming rapture of the church. I still kind of lean in that direction, but, but it does raise some questions. And I don't have the time to address those questions in this series or even this morning. But, but suffice to say this, it may and it may not be. Many also believe this, this heralds the beginning of the Great Tribulation, but we can't be dogmatic here since the scroll and the context 
and the contents of the scrolls remain unrevealed in full in the Lamb's hand until all the seven seals are opened. But what are the seals? Seal number one is war, riding in the white horse. Seal two, murder and genocide in the red horse, indicative of extreme, extreme bloodshed and war. Seal number three represents global economic collapse. We're seeing the signs of that all around us, are we not? As they rise in the black horse. And then coming on the pale green horse, death and hell. In fact, the book of Revelation is clear that during this time, after the, after the fourth seal is opened, that a quarter of the world's population at that time will die. Well, if you do the rough math, that's approximately two billion people at least it's present. Seal number five is judgment of all those who slew the martyrs. We watched the scene, didn't we? We saw um, sacks, uh, crude sacks placed at the heads of, of Christians and, and, uh, and Orthodox Christians in, in places where terrorists were, were, were rife and, and saw them apprehended and, and uh, kneeling down on the beach and, and with, a, with a sword at their neck ready to be slain. There have been, through the centuries, thousands of believers that were slain because they stood for Christ. There will be a judgment on that. There will be a judgment. Uh, creation itself will deliver a judgment. All of creation will be affected by the coming pending judgment of God. Earthquakes. The sun will be darkened. There will be blood moons. We're seeing already numerous. Uh, stars like meteors will fall to earth. And then seal number seven, the attention shifts now to Israel. So what is happening today in the Middle East is very significant. God has not forgotten his ancient covenant to his people Israel. Don't believe, do not believe everything that comes out of the media that criticizes Israel. Do not believe it. It is not true. Yes. There are innocent people that have died. Yes, there are innocent children and women that have perished. Do not believe everything the media tells you. Slide number seven. Then I saw another angel rising up from the east who had the seal of the living God. And I heard the number of the seal, 144,000 seals from every tribe of the Israelites. He remains committed to protect his ancient people from annihilation. But, but as we will see during the Great Tribulation, as we look at it shortly, there is a time of severe testing and purging that is coming to Israel. That is why the Tribulation period is sometimes called Jacob's Trouble in reference to his people, Israel. I think that was thunders and relevant. The story of the resurrected Israel of the 20th century is no less than a miracle. 144,000, who are they? Well, if you were a Jehovah's Witness, you would believe these are the only anointed that will be saved, that will dwell in heaven with God. And that is just quite simply unbiblical and wrong. These are not born again Christian believers, that. Here again, the Bible interprets itself before the worst really sets in, the final three and a half years of the, of the Great Tribulation. Um, and it, it, God will call and seal 144,000 converted Jewish followers, 12,000 from each of the tribes of Israel that embrace Jesus as Messiah and Lord. In fact, the, the conversion of unbelievers to the followers of Jesus Messiah will not be confined to Jewish converts. Many, many will be soundly saved and turn to put their faith in Jesus in those perilous times. Revelation chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. After this I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. What is this? This is a 
This is what could be best called the Great Tribulation Revival. Who are these? Where did they where did they come from? Where did all these people of nations and tribes and people and languages come from? The term tribulation saints is often applied to them by numerous Bible scholars, but, but it is the text that clearly tells us in Revelation 7, 14. These are the one coming out of the great tribulation. For they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Again, mercy in the midst of judgment. Come to the seven, seven trumpets. More woes still. But before we talk of the trumpets, I want to sound the horn over something first. And it is the high value of prayer that God, that God places on prayer in the eyes of God. Revelation chapter 8. Another angel with a golden incense burner came and stood at the altar. He was given a large amount of incense to offer the prayers of all the saints in the golden altar in front of the house, in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense and the prayers of the saints went up in the presence of God from the angel's hand. Don't ever think, not even for a moment, that God does not hear or respond to your prayer. That your prayers don't matter much. That they're not important. Then the trumpet blew, Angel after angel, all angels. Trumpet one, hail and fire mixed with blood, connects with plagues that were pronounced upon Egypt of old. Trumpet, trumpet two, huge meteor like a, like a great mountain, we are told. Uh, one third uh, of the sea turned into blood. One third of the animals and creatures in the, on the planet died. One third of the ships that sailed the seas were destroyed. Trumpet number three, wormworm is the term that is used here for star, a great star actually, that fell to earth and poisoned one third of the earth's fresh water. Again, again, speaking back to the plagues upon Israel of so long ago. Trumpet four, darkness in the heaven, the sun, the moon, and the stars. Can you imagine what it would be like if God just somehow turned off the lights? Suddenly we're plunged into darkness. Maybe just a little bit reminiscent of the moment right now. You came in in sunshine and now it's now dark. Mm -hmm. the, this woe announces a warning that the last three trumpet judgments are even more severe than the first four. Trumpet five, most unusual asteroid of epic size and, and, and effect strikes the earth, setting off an entire series of, of frightening events. Strange emissions from the Earth's core, billows of smoke polluting our air quality, locusts of some bizarre kind uh, that don't damage the environment but attack humans. These are unbelievers, inflicting great pain and torment. So much so that people were told, John tells us, actually despair of life. Revelation 9, verse 6. Oh, I wish I had never preached this stuff. I honestly do. These are, these are, this is, this is the stuff of, of terror. It's, it's frightening to an unbeliever. It should be. Brothers 9, 6, in those days people will seek death but will not find it. They will long to die but death will flee from them. People will despair of life in those days. Trumpet says, some believe this is a prediction of World War III all-out, full-scale nuclear war. And it could be, but it could also be supernaturally generated by God himself in righteous judgment of the world. God will release unusual creatures in vast numbers to afflict the human race. Many will further despair of life, but still others, still others, many others, will cry out to God for mercy and repentance. And just before the seventh trumpet blow, two witnesses will appear in the scene, sent of God with great authority. And they will invite people to be saved and rescued from the terror to come. Again, more mercy. And John tells us that for 1260 days, if you do the math, that's three and a half years, will faithfully witness and prophesy, leading many to Jesus. 
powerful, spirit-driven pronouncement of the gospel like this world has never seen before. Like two supercharged Billy Graham's will roam the earth. Supernaturally protected from the fiercest opposition that the devil could possibly direct at them until the work and mission is complete. And then, and then the beast will succeed and kill them. And their bodies will lie in the main street of Jerusalem for three and a half days. And in that day, you can, you can bet the news networks of the world all the nations of the world will announce their deaths and show footage and even video footage of this. And in that day, it will feel eerily like Christmas because the people of the earth will be so joyous that the witnesses finally dead. They will, they will exchange gifts. It's going to feel a little bit like Christmas. Can you imagine? <clears throat> then God supernaturally raises them from the dead. Every eye will see it. <coughs> fear will come upon people. But for some, it will be the fear of God leading them to repent. Again, more mercy. And they will be saved. And as they watch this remarkable scene, suddenly God will translate them to heaven in an instant, as he did Enoch from a long time ago. Still others, were told, will be killed in a massive earthquake. So massive that 7,000 people will be killed in its way. Trumpet 7 tells us of a spectacular scene that occurs in heaven, where the 24 elders are. The 24 elders are symbolic of the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. A time of unparalleled worship of God and a declaration. Two things. A declaration of two things from the God of heaven. Revelation chapter 11, verse 18. It is time to judge the dead and to reward your servants, the prophets, as well as your holy people and all who fear your name. A time of judgment for the unbelieving dead. A time of reward, great reward for those who love and fear God. I have to stop there. Uh, and it will be continued in two weeks. Because I still need to tell you at the end. <coughs> And the false prophet of their beginning and their end, the final harvest of the lost, an incredible moment, and a, a number of other events that unfold right up to the end of God's, God's program to call humanity to Himself, and the final judgment of our world, of the nations and the people of planet Earth. And that will lead me to the last message about heaven. I'll be honest, I can't wait to talk to you about. But I will live today with this. I'm going to turn your attention to it. Please follow me on the screen behind me. It comes from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live. Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flame. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and new earth that he has promised, a world filled with God's righteousness. We just stand together and pray for you. Father, we thank you. We are in awe that in the midst of, of horrendous judgment, of a God of pure wrath, balanced by pure love, that we see your mercy. And all through the judgments, again and again and again, over and over and over, we see wonderful opportunities, wonderful doors that are open for those who would receive, for those who would accept, for those who would open the door of their heart and invite you to come and be central in their heart and life. And here this morning, for any of you that could be here, you too are given that same opportunity. If you have never before invited Jesus to be your personal Savior, there is no better time than right here, right now. And so if you'd like to, I want you to follow me in a simple prayer. Don't pray it if you don't mean it. You don't even pray it if you've already prayed it before. This is not a religious ritual. It is a very intimate, personal prayer that you can make to God this morning. Yes, Lord. 
Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you. I thank you. For I know today that you died for my sins. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being obedient to the cross. Forgive me, Lord, for I am a sinner. I invite you into my heart and into my life. Help me from this day on to love you, to serve you, to live you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. Father, we thank you so much. We're so grateful. It's so amazing to be your children, to sense your presence, O oh Lord, to know your love, to experience your mercy, O oh Lord. We are grateful and thankful for it. Lord, as we, as we dismiss now this morning, Lord, I pray, let us go out, not with heavy hearts, not at all in sadness, we know that we will not stop what is about to, to come in time to come. But Lord, we are your people. We've been called by your name. You have called us into a, into a, into a life of, of joy and a life of peace, Lord. And that should reign in rule in our lives. And so, Father, we, we go out with, a, with an attitude of joy and celebration. And heaviness only in knowing that we have a responsibility to share the truth of the gospel with anyone and everyone as you would give us opportunity in mm. Jesus name. Jesus name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Please stay for something to drink, something to share and spend some time together, would you? If you do, if you would like prayer, we're going to remain at the front. If there are those of you that can assist me in prayer ministry, that would be great. Just want you to know that prayer is always available if you have a need. God bless you. God bless you.